Hello, and welcome back to the APSCC webinar series for 2021. I'm Christopher Slaughter, your MC for the series. Today, the subject is venture capital. Where is the money going? Uh, what's it doing? How is it working? Uh, and who's getting it? And, and what are the plans for the future? So it's a look at what, uh, what happened during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, what has happened during the COVID pandemic in 2020, how that's affected uh, funding for the, the space industry, and a look forward for what we can expect in 2021. Um, lots of conversation expected about SPACs coming up. Uh, joining us as the moderator for this panel, Jason Rainbow of Space News. We also have Mike Collett from Promus Ventures, uh, Mark Boggett from Seraphim Capital, Hide Aoki from Global Brain, uh, and they'll be talking about all of the trends in money in Asia and around the world. So uh, please uh, join us in welcoming them. Thank you, Chris. And uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this discussion on venture capital in space. It's a pleasure to be moderating this webinar today with representatives from across the world. Uh, of course, many in our audience will be aware of how even before the pandemic hit the world's markets, it was already a very interesting time for venture capital in space. The influx of VC money in the sector has already done so much to reshape the entire industry. But I think what will be a surprise to many will be how even as COVID-19 began tightening its grip on the world, VC continued its record-breaking march through the sector in 2020. Although the picture is probably uh, not so rosy if you look at the roadblocks to, to the new funds looking to get in the, in the action and the very, very early stages. But um, as, as vaccines are raising hopes to a return to a, a new normal, or perhaps a return to a, uh, well, who knows, a, a brave new world, uh, we're here today to discuss where the markets are heading in 2021. So before we delve into our discussion, I'd like to invite each panelist to introduce themselves and, and give a quick rundown of their space portfolio and the kinds of companies that they're looking to invest in. And uh, Mark, if we if we can uh, start with you. Great. Hi there, um, everyone. Um, delighted to be here. So I'm Mark Boggart. I'm one of the founders and I'm the CEO at Seraphim Capital. So we're a fa space-focused investment firm that includes a venture fund and an accelerator program called Space Camp. So we've built a portfolio of international startups um, that number nearly 60 now um, that include uh, companies like Spire, Leo Labs, um, ISI, AST and Science. Um, we typically invest at seed or Series A or early Series B and uh, targeting international businesses. We're really trying to identify the uh, potential emerging category leaders across the different subcategories of the space ecosystem. Great, and Mike? Hi, uh, my name is Mike Collette. I am a managing partner at Promise Ventures. We uh, have been around since 2012, have invested in over 85 companies in the US, EU, UK, uh, Australia, uh, and New Zealand. Uh, we um, have been lucky to be in a lot of great uh, space companies, uh, including Rocket Lab, BiSci, uh, Spire, Mapbox, Aurora, Isotropic, Envue, uh, a bunch of others. But uh, we really do focus on uh, the, the, the deep tech landscape. We have offices in San Francisco and Luxembourg. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and Hidei. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Uh, my name is Hide Aoki. I'm a director at Global Brain. Uh, Global Brain is one of the, uh, Japan's largest uh, venture capital, early stage focused fund. And uh, we are $1.5 billion asset under management. Uh, although we are headquartered in Tokyo, we also have offices in San Francisco, New York, London, uh, Singapore, uh, Korea, uh, Indonesia, and uh, China as well. And uh, we have over 200 portfolio companies invested. Out of those, uh, 10 startups are space-related related startups, mainly in Japan, including Axospace, Regi, or Gitai, uh, which is developing a humanoid uh, a robot. Uh, thanks, uh, and uh, looking forward to this panel. Brilliant stuff. OK, well, let's start with uh, a look at how the pandemic has been affecting your various space activities. And Mark, we can start again with you, if that's OK. Where have your space companies been doing well under COVID, perhaps surprisingly well? Uh, and also, where have the problem areas been? Where have they struggled or, 
or maybe still finding it challenging? Yeah, so uh, as, we, as we went into the, uh, the pandemic, um, we got all of our companies well prepared. So um, we uh, reduced overheads, um, we saved costs, we brought forward funding plans and, uh, and really buttoned down the hatches to get the companies prepared. So we've actually been presently surprised overall about the actual impact of COVID. So where we found um, um, it surprisingly helpful is that um, sales cycles in many cases have shortened with, uh, with many people just doing Zoom calls rather than flying around the world, meeting customers. Things seem to be happening quicker. So that's, uh, that's really been um, a positive. Um, everybody uh, is much more productive. There's a blurring line between uh, home life and work life. People are just working more hours. So uh, there's definitely been a massive increase in productivity. Um, all of the organizations are, uh, are, are, are skinned down. They're, they're, they're lean, but they are being very efficient. And, uh, and there's been plenty of funding ar- uh, available. So um, and that's been one of the biggest surprises. Um, you know, just uh, in 2020, um, there was a 70% increase in VC investment into uh, the global market in space tech which has come as a great surprise. So in many cases, that's uh, led to us bringing forward um, our uh, funding plans for 2021 into 2020. So many of our businesses are surprisingly well-funded through last year. Where we found it challenging is that um, there's been uh, many delays to launch. So getting things into space has uh, has proved uh, problematic. Uh, Whilst there's been plenty of money available, closing investment rounds has still been taking longer than normal. Investors are having to get used to uh, not actually meeting the the entrepreneurs that they're backing, and it just takes a little bit longer uh, as a result of uh, of that. And then um, the other thing that I think uh, has been key is limited staff on on site, particularly for our manufacturing businesses. Uh, That's really uh, been a challenge. I mean, they've they've found great ways of working around this and uh, been really efficient in the way that they've been operating, but nevertheless, it's uh, it's been challenging. And then finally, we found it's slow going with um, um, the military um, uh, that we're working with. So with DoD um, in America, MOD in 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 UK. Whilst there's been a huge amount of engagement, there's just been it's been very slow, a lot slower than we would have liked compared to the commercial sector. So that's definitely the highlights and, and lowlights that we've found from our our portfolio. Yeah, a bit of a mixed picture. Mike, would you have anything to add to that? Is it pretty much the same over in your markets? Yeah, I know that, that's a good summary, I think, from Mark. Um, I, I would say the, the you know, the big have gotten bigger and the small, uh, you know, continue to do what they need to do. I, I think the, the capital available in the equity market and the debt market post-pandemic has, you know, across the board, right, all the way has been, you know, very, very strong, way stronger than people think. And yeah, I, I do think, um, you know, from a stream standpoint, uh, one Mark alluded to just the productivity and efficiency, um, just the startups do, uh, they have to find a way. And so it's had to trickle down to the capital sources, to the customers to figure out, do we actually do this project? Do we actually move forward having not even met this team in person? And that goes from the investors to customers to government. The governments and sovereigns of the world will be the last in line to be comfortable you know, doing those decisions without the typical meetings. But when borders are closed and you can't, and space is a global industry, and you can't actually get that done, you either find a way to do it or you don't do it. So uh, I think what we've found is people are doing it. And that's been very surprising. So obviously, the the ones that have been in the market for a long time, the ones that have revenue, are getting rewarded in tremendous ways uh, from from an equity side. So for the first time, at least since I've been, you know, doing space stuff, you know, there is uh, there's there's capital, there, there are large amounts of capital available to the winners. And that typically has just never been the case for all the years of these panels and conferences and what the market looks like, uh, you know, for the first time, the window has been open on story stocks from a, from an equity market standpoint. If, you know, the, the tenure goes to two or even three and the whole party comes down and duration assets go away and story stocks blow up, you know, maybe that's not a great thing for space. But 
you know, I think I think what has surprised everyone is just the amount of capital going into the winners in the industry. Yeah, uh, I know we definitely want to get into uh, the exits and the spikes a bit later on in this discussion. Um, Today, is that fairly reflective of the environment in Japan and in Asia in general? Yeah, Max. Um, so there is no doubt that the fundraising has become uh, more difficult for early stage startups after COVID-19 because, uh, you know, investors are more selective and focused when it comes to decision making. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say we have become more conservative, but uh, just being more selective, I would say. Uh, but uh, we will not hesitate to invest if there is an uh, opportunity. And it has become more challenging for seed and early stage uh, focus startups, uh, you know, um, as uh, investors sometimes want to see uh, the tractions before they invest. That has been uh, some of the issues. And uh, um, remote sensing uh, companies are doing well, actually, uh, because uh, analyzing images from uh, space uh, can help analyze and predict the uh, uh, effect of uh, COVID-19. Uh, especially many manufacturing companies uh, w- want to see the impact of uh, their supply chain, uh, so w- which uh, brought a lot of uh, demand uh, in, in, in Japan. And uh, uh, for our portfolio companies, uh, we usually, uh, you know, advise them to keep as low burn rate as uh, possible, um, just uh, like uh, what the Mark, Mark and uh, Mike said. And mm-hmm. uh, as you know, cash is king. Uh, thanks to COVID-19, many startups have been uh, uh, able to review their uh, uh, wasteful spending and have become uh, leaner, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. And then, and but where there have been setbacks, could you could anyone speak to how, as an investor, how you manage that? Have has uh, have you been approached by any space companies or others in your portfolio that have run into issues? And and how do you work through that? What what does that conversation look like? Any takers? Yeah. So I mean, I'm happy to take this. You know, as uh, as uh, Heide just uh, mentioned, you know, cash is king, and uh, protecting cash in difficult circumstances is key to survival. So uh, what we've seen is um, um, founders uh, and key staff across the board taking serious pay cuts so that they are extending their runway. Um, had to make really difficult decisions about furloughing staff and which staff uh, go on to sort of furlough programs supported by government. And indeed, when when you bring those back off furlough, as uh, as also as equally as difficult as part of the decision process, so it's really all about this effective management of cash, really that has been the sort of focus. And um, you know, this is where startups are, uh, are are very good at doing this. You know, they're prepared to take the pain because they believe in the future. So one of the one of the interesting things about the COVID uh, crisis is that everybody's been able to sort of look through it and see that this is going to, uh, going to going to come through and get right again. So this is the reason why investors have been supportive and uh, and companies are really finding ways through. Mark, you alluded to how 2020 helped break records in VC and, and VC in space. What can you say about how Q1 2021 is looking? I know at Seraphim, you have, uh, you have a close eye on this with the Seraphim Space Index. Uh, yeah, what can you yeah. say? as this quarter comes to an end, how are things looking? So, um, so I haven't had a sneak peek at the numbers yet. We uh, we, we do we do them uh, in, in in for the end of each quarter. So, um, the uh, where my, my general sense at the moment is um, because of this huge range of um, SPAC announcements that we've seen in the space sector. I think that that is really going to be driving the appetite for the venture community to support these space related investment opportunities. So my, my expectation is that we're going to see Q1 as, a, as another record quarter. I think that, um, that there's never been as high a level of interest in the market in space-related investment opportunities, and I think that will flow through to the numbers. It's been interesting last year that it was a very sort of polarised market where there was significant amounts of new capital going in at seed, significant amounts of new capital that were going in on the, on the maturer C and D rounds, but um, less so in the, uh, particularly in the A series. So I think that uh, we're going to see a, a pickup in A series investment during this year. Now that there's sort of some visibility, some light at the tunnel at the end of the tunnel for this um, pandemic being left behind us. Would the other two panelists agree with that sentiment? Are you looking towards uh, another record-breaking quarter? 
not in your markets. How about you, Hide? Yeah, I think uh, it will be a record high again. Uh, so this quarter, I think it will be uh, still looking uh, strong. And going back to uh, last year, uh, year 2020 was also uh, our record high for our uh, uh, venture capital as well. We have invested uh, uh, over $150 million in 100 startups uh, last year for seed and uh, round A and B. And uh, we're expecting more this year, which means that uh, I think uh, this quarter is looking strong. Great. And Mike, what permanent changes do you think COVID-19 uh, is probably making to the way just VC operates in general? Are you, are you expecting a return to the coffees and face-to-face -face meetings that used to be so critical for this sector or, or something else once the pandemic eventually uh, you know, subsides? I hope so. Um, I hope we get back on a planet to being human again and actually, you know, shaking heads and hugging people. So, yeah, I do. But there is a permanent change that we fully believe in the way that uh, VCs operate. It's clearly going to get much flatter. Uh, clearly, VCs are going to be able to now do deals across uh, the globe uh, much quicker ways. They are the LPs will be pr probably more reticent for them to do those. As now we've had a year of everybody operating online and being okay and watching things actually go okay. Uh, so unless there are massive blowups, um, meaning you know, did you just miss something because you didn't walk around the office? Uh, which you can. Those are risks. But yeah, no, we will go back to uh, in, in, into those face to face meetings. But, you know, the sort of exodus of you can only invest uh, on Sand Hill Road mantra of San Francisco VCs, you know, that that was starting to to, to bane, you know, pre-pandemic. So, you know, the world's getting flatter, continues to. Uh, there are terrific, you know, deep tech teams all over the globe. Uh, and, and, and you can, and then that will always be the case. And so I do think funding is going to now find those places in greater ways. And I think like I think board meetings will change. I don't think uh, there will have to be a in in person board meeting every single time in different countries. Uh, you know, listen. I think as all of us on this panel live on planes, um, that's a welcome respite. And I don't think it's just for our personal lives. I think, uh, frankly, there's there's a lot more that can be done with video, and there are different meetings, different committee meetings, and other things that can happen rather than in, in in person. So nothing beats in person, but the efficiency of the way that founders and investors are working now, uh, I think, continues. I just to add to that though, I do think that innovation um, could potentially suffers by uh, living in a Zoom world. I think there's a huge amount to be said about having teams together, you know, the actual play off each other, the conversations around the water cooler. I think this is where a lot of the innovation actually happens. And because we've only really been sort of locked down in this sort of problem for the last year, I don't think that, we're, uh, that we've really suffered from the impact on innovation. I think the longer it goes on, we are going to feel more impact because of the lack of being able to be together and uh, the way that that spurns new ideas particularly in our markets. Yeah, and I think part of the reason why VC has managed to plow through these turbulent times, I gather, has been the effect that the pandemic has had on accelerating certain trends that are also just positive for the sector in general. I, I keep a close eye on the activity around connectivity and, and the investments being made there to, to close the digital divide. And of course, space has a critical role to play there, uh, but there's just a lot of investor optimism for space just broadly yeah, at the moment. Um, so what investment opportunities has COVID-19 created for space? Anyone want to take a stab at that? So well, yeah, well, I'm happy. Uh, go, go, go ahead, Mark. Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Um, so, so I think uh, we've touched on this already. I think, I think the opportunity that it's created is just a significant amount more capital available to the sector. So, you know, the 70% the up last year, you know, this is, these are meaningful sums of money that are coming into this sector, which are, which are enabled companies to do much more uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a faster time frame, which I think is going to result in more capital coming into the sector. So for me, 
the, the, the real impact of COVID is about just the availability of capital and, uh, and how there's just been much, much more of an investor focus on this as a sector. Hey, Mike? Yeah, um, and, and I would just say on that, I think is if you measure it by total amount of capital coming in, obviously these numbers are going to be very large uh, because you've got some winners who are taking just a lot of that. I think the key is going to be has the pie expanded, you know, into into the series A's and B's that Mark alluded to, which are still difficult to get done at times. Um, seed will always be there. Seed will always, I think, increase. Uh, has this as uh, have the winners now put income statements on to which the public markets now think that there is enough here to you know put hundreds of million dollars on the balance sheets. And that clearly has been shown with some of these SPAC issues and announcements. Now, does that trickle down, right? Does that mean now there's a new wave of, of investors coming downstream to put into those, those companies? I think we'll have to see. Um, I, I'm, I don't know about that. I, 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 think it's, I think it's still difficult, as stated, to, for some of these middle rounds to get done, the, the story stock A, B rounds to get done. And um, as I said before, the winners are winning, and uh, that's probably distorting the the upper numbers. Uh, the metal really hits the road when you get into the A's and B's, and um, as has been many years before, as we've all talked about and watched, um, you know the Spires uh, and ISIs and Rocket Labs of the world, you know, um, had to muddle through and get through those early days, and it wasn't easy uh, raising that capital. So. But they did, and now they're in a place where their income statements are are being rewarded by the market. So we'll see how much um, the market looks to to sort of these growth areas in the early rounds. Hey Dave, do you have anything to add to that? Are there any pockets of space that now look a little bit differently after the pandemic, which are maybe exciting opportunities for you? Yeah, I can add some uh, uh, opportunities for investors' uh, uh, perspective. Uh, so after COVID-19, it became uh, relatively uh, easier to negotiate the valuation. Before COVID-19, the valuation was too high in many cases, especially for a B round and A round. And the stock price was not a fair value for us uh, by any means, but uh, it has become, uh, you know, significantly negotiable, uh, which means that the more opportunities for uh, uh, investors as well. Good stuff. Great. Me, well, let, I, 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 oh, hey, Jason, let, let me add one part on that. I think, I think what's going to be interesting here moving forward is now you're going to have a handful of public companies uh, that at least at the valuations uh, that you're seeing now are very healthy. And so do private uh, comp space companies now peg their valuations at discounts to those healthy um, numbers, given that those companies are further along than they are, but say, well, listen, I mean, if this company is worth this, then we're worth this. And we'll see what the market thinks of that. Um, that'll be a next, uh, next act of this uh, play that we're watching moving forward. Okay, well, let's, let's address that elephant in the room, because we can't have a discussion about VC without talking about SPACs or uh, special purpose acquisition companies, which um, simply put, they offer space companies significant amounts of capital relatively quickly in a, in a fast track route to, to public markets. Just a very, very simple explanation there. Uh, according to SPAC Insider, which is a site that tracks SPAC activity, there were 246 IPOs of SPACs um, across all industries from the start of the year to March 11. Uh, which is nearly the same number as all of 2020. So there's just rampant investor appetite here. Um, and Mark and Mike, I think if I'm right, you both have two space companies in your portfolio that have announced SPACs. How would you say this trend is, is changing the VC landscape? And, and Mark, do you want to you start? Um, yeah, so um, I, I think it's um, the, this trend is marking an inflection point for the new space uh, market. Which is which is great news. Um, I think more generally, um, SPACs are breaking the trend of, uh, of of companies staying private for longer, which uh, which I think is a good thing. Which is un ultimately unlocking um, pools of public capital um, to be brought into companies that would uh, would otherwise have stayed um, uh, private. 
So uh, in the, uh, specifically in the space sector, I think that um, SPACs are creating a, a tremendous opportunity for emerging category leaders and those that are able to um, access this type of funding first. Um, what, what enables them to be able to do is to uh, accelerate their vision, fully funding all of the um, uh, equity requirements of their business in a, in a single transaction. So um, you know, rather than doing a C round, a D round, an E round, it's all rolled into a single round. And that enables the uh, management teams then to focus on the business. If you think about how much time a management team spend on the road on their fundraising each year, it can easily be a third of the year or even half of the year that they're, uh, that they're really very focused on that as a principal activity. So I think taking that out of the equation and giving these companies the significant amount of money to be able to, uh, to, drive, to drive their businesses forward, I think that we're going to see some really compelling results there. It's effectively taking the uh, the soft bank business model and uh, and applying it through SPACs. And um, you know, whilst uh, soft bank has got some 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 mixed outcomes, I think overall, uh, if applied correctly, it's a strategy that can really work. So it's a it's a it's a really interesting time for the new space ecosystem. And I think that this has come at a fabulous time for the for the maturing companies that are now clearly uh, the leaders within this sector. Mike. Um... I wonder if you can give me a sense of how many how many calls are you getting from SPAC sponsors every day now? Are, are we at a point where um, SPACs are challenging private equity for for exits, maybe space exits? Yeah, well, it, it's been it's been a it's been a fascinating nine months, say, in terms of really the activity of SPAC, really last year. Um, and I think you said that. I mean, who is who is worried about SPACs the most? It's the it's really the growth. Investors, it's the PE investors who have owned that sort of billion to ten billion number. Uh, Mark alluded to it before. You know, the, the long dur- long duration risk on appetite of the equity markets have enabled private equity or sorry startups to stay private for a long, long, long time. And um, that, in my mind, is just not a healthy thing. It's it's there because capital is there, but we've always posited that companies should put on their Big boy and big girl pants, and go public at some point, and and who's to say we don't get back to the normality of markets where you'd go out to raise 100 to 200 million in an IPO directly? There's no reason we can't get back to those levels at some point into the future. But again, just you know, with low interest rates, they enable uh, and foster environments like this. So it's not as if this is a bad thing. It's just uh, people are taking advantage of it. So um, right now. Um, I think there's an opportunity uh, for SPACs to be able to take that middle ground where typically, uh, you know, the growth investors and private equity firms have played. So that's a risk to their business model, um, which is why you're seeing a lot of PE firms uh, throwing up SPACs all over the place. Uh, so um, I do think SPACs get a bad name because it's just a it's it's just a way to get something out. You can get mad at the valuations. You can get mad at the story stocks, and again, this is across the board: EV, autonomy, um, you know, flying taxis. Uh, you know, there's a lot. There, there's there's a great conversation around just the geopolitical uh, strategy in which a story stock, which needs a lot of capital, like space, uh, looks at what happens when their competitors and others go to the market, and as Mark said, put hundreds of million dollars on, on their balance sheet. Uh, whether the SPAC gets done, whether you know the despacking process, you know, leads to actually uh, a, a deal that that closes, um, which it sometimes won't, but assume that they all do. How do competitors deal with companies, even if their stock actually decreases a lot, who now have put an incredible amount of cash, which is just which has not been available to the space industry, You've just not seen those numbers outside of SpaceX. Um, and Rocket Lab say, you know, put uh, and a few others just put that amount of capital on their balance sheet. So it's an extraordinary competitive advantage. Uh, and at the same time, the market is brutal. Uh, they will give it, it will give and take, it will crush you when you miss expectations. And goodness knows, um, running companies are very hard. And so private companies get the benefit of missing numbers and not getting tanked 
that will not happen in the public market. You have to execute um, and you have to execute on what you say you need to execute. So uh, it'll be it'll be fun to watch. It'll be really good. This is a very, very healthy thing, I, I think. And I also don't think SPACs are going anywhere anytime soon. Do you think the stimulus checks that are getting into U.S. bank accounts right now will help fan the flames of, of the SPAC trend? Uh, you know, I think that's a retail play, right? You know, the real drivers are the institutions. And I think what's fascinating now is the SPAC market and the oversubscription of the books on 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 those have just gone down because, you know, there's there's too much, there's too many SPACs out there chasing too many pipe dollars of which there's trust available. So, so, you know, the Fidelities and other companies of the world are getting much, much pickier in terms of who they're going to put money into their SPACs. Uh, the, 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 pipe side, the pipe side is where, you know, the deals get done and they get priced basically. And, and so when that market, there's only so much of that dollars available, right? So, you know, you're seeing a great institutionalization of the SPAC market now and the, and the capital going in. The people who went in early clearly got an advantage and kudos to those people that did that. But now, um, you, you know, they're, they're, it just, money doesn't grow on trees. So, uh, you know, there's only so much to go in. And so you're seeing r- really the need for very quality assets now that go out into SPAC and the ones that aren't are getting passed by. Great. And Hidei, I understand that SPACs aren't exactly allowed in Japan. Is that putting your market at some kind of disadvantage or are there other mechanisms at, at play over there? Yeah, uh, we are out of a stock uh, business in Tokyo. Uh, unfortunately, stock is not possible at Tokyo Stock Exchange at this moment because of its regulations of a stock exchange. Uh, we don't know if it will be deregulated or not uh, in Japan. So it's just the stock is being uh, ignored at the moment. That's something that's happening uh, on the other side of the ocean. However, uh, just like uh, uh, Mark said, that instead of uh, going to C round, D round, E round, SPAC is one of the uh, options for startups. And actually, for Tokyo Stock Exchange, most of the startups uh, going to public uh, are uh, uh, they go to public after raising B round instead of going to C, D, and E round. It has been like that for last uh, I don't know uh, several decades. So uh, Tokyo Exchange can be said as uh, uh, just uh, doing as a SPAC. So it's very unique uh, market, but uh, um, uh, it's, it's very interesting to see uh, what's happening uh, you know, in the U- US and Europe. Yeah, I got it. Uh, great, well, at this point, I'd like to really um, take a moment to take advantage of the fact that we have experts from across the world here uh, in VC, because there, there is, from what I see, a, a general geopolitical trend for countries to be more inward looking, shall we say, uh, these days for for various reasons. So my question is, has that affected the VC landscape at all? Has it it complicated investments, created opportunities perhaps? Um, Yeah, who would like to take a stab at that one? Uh, Mark? Yeah, I'm uh, always happy to go first. Thank you, uh, Jason. yeah, it's uh, it's making life more challenging um, because um, you're not you're not um, relying on a sort of rational buyer. The uh, the rational buyer will buy the best product at the best price from the best party, and uh, you know those are the companies that we're trying to back. Um, the, the the leaders within particular markets. So uh, so what this sort of inward um, country focused uh, change to the landscape means is that. Um, Companies with an inferior product, an inferior pricing, inferior capability are winning contracts, and uh, and that's challenging. Um, so um, you know it's uh, it's 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 increasingly becoming harder for European companies to uh, compete in in U.S. markets, particularly uh, where they relate to uh, to defence. Um, you know, so that's challenging, and uh, you know I, I I don't see this trend reversing anytime in the, in the near future. So. We're trying to invest into global companies that are the uh, that are aiming to be the the, the best um, in their markets, and um, there are certain countries that they're just not able to uh, to win out on, despite their position. Uh, Hidei, um, I know you're very active in U.S. markets. Have you been caught up at all in any restrictions targeting non-U.S. companies? Um. 
We have invested more than 40 startups, 40, 40 startups uh, into U.S. so far, and we had no issue whatsoever when it comes to investing or getting approval for CFIUS uh, uh, regulations. And uh, uh, the reason why we, we invest into uh, non-Japanese startups are to connect uh, those startups with Japanese market by introducing uh, potential Japanese large clients and uh, some uh, big market. So uh, we as an investor coming from Japan are very much welcome in the United States uh, as a strategic investors. Good to hear. Uh, Mike, how do you think a Biden administration will affect the VC landscape in the US? Do you see any changes at all? Yeah, well, uh, well we'll see on that. Um, you know, the Trump administration was a boom for the space industry. You know, it, it's, you know, two big signature initiatives of Artemis, you know, NASA's return to, to the moon and the Space Force, which established the sixth branch of the U.S. Uh, armed Armed forces. So Biden administration, you know, they've come in and dismantled most of Trump's legacy with, you know, plenty of executive orders in the first weeks. And um, frankly, it didn't look very good for space in the early days either. Uh, the Biden administration said virtually nothing about space during their campaign. And when first asked about the Space Force, the White House press secretary openly mocked it. Um, and later, when asked about Artemis, said she didn't know what the administration's stance was. So I think it was clear where Biden's priorities were from a space standpoint coming in. Now, thankfully, the press secretary has walked both of those back and have said they, you know, the administration does support both Space Force and Artemis. But, um, but we'll see. Okay. And Mark, we're seeing a really big push right now from, well, from the UK to go after the space market. It's gonna be an important pillar for the country in Brexit's wake. Uh, what kind of measures are you seeing in the UK and, and, and Europe really uh, to take on Silicon Valley uh, when it comes to space? Yeah, well, um, talking about it really from, the, from a UK Brexit point of view, first of all, um, the UK government is really doing two things. Uh, one is um, they are being very clear about the um, the markets that they want to work with, the countries that they want to work with, where they are trying to align strategic government priorities. So uh, these countries include uh, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, India, France, Germany, and, uh, and, and, the, and the GCC. So uh, very specific uh, engagements with each of those different regions is, is underway. We've seen the first of these already the announcement of a sort of investment bridge um, in relation to space uh, with the Australian government. I think we're going to see many more of these. So that's one element. The other thing that uh, the UK government are doing is the coordination of um, overall government as a customer. So they're recognising the importance that they uh, can play by uh, providing uh, revenues and, and early revenues to, to companies in the sector. So what we're seeing is... Um, the UK Defence and Intelligence, we're seeing the UK Space Agency, we're seeing the Ministry of Defence and government departments that are coordinating together to try and operate with a, with a single sort of one voice for government in what their space-related requirements are. So, uh, so if this is successful, I think, uh, and, and they can coordinate in the way, so this is actually underway at the moment, so we've not actually seen any of the benefits of this yet. But I think if they if they are successful in doing that, then I think that we're going to see um, you know some big benefits uh, coming through from that. We've also seen uh, the UK government um, acting very decisively and surprising uh, the the markets by making investments in startups like OneWeb. So um, I'd like to think that that's not the last of these sort of unexpected moves that uh, that we're seeing from from the UK government. So they really very much are focused on space as a a sector of strategic importance, and they're really trying to sort of align themselves behind that. So in, in relation to uh, to Europe, to answer the second part of your question, um, what we're seeing here is, um, is, is, uh, is activity that's really been going on for the last couple of years that's really coming to a head now, largely driven by the European Investment Bank, um, where space has been identified as a, as a sector of, uh, 
of, of importance to uh, the overall um, union. And uh, they've identified venture and the, uh, and the startup community as one that they can influence. So the EIF has, um, has, has, has um, started focusing um, dollars directly into investment funds in this area. And Mike, I'm sure, will comment next, is the beneficiary of, uh, of, of this um, in terms of them trying to uh, provide LP funding direct to space-focused uh, venture firms with the idea there that that's going to, to lead to investment to grow, grow space-related businesses in Europe rather than relying on US and Asia to, uh, to, to, fund, to fund them. So Mike, that might be one that you might want to pick up on. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think it's it's been great to watch the UK and the EU uh, get behind space and really try to open up capital to companies to invest into those regions. Um, I'm not sure it's a response to the US and the amount of dollars that come out of the US government. Um, or the national security issues that you know all the sovereigns are dealing with, but I think it's it's very welcome, and we have always just really been enamored not only in the U.S. but in the EU and UK of very very talented uh, geospatial back end engineers and um, and companies over there doing super things. So uh, we continue to think EU is an arbitrage opportunity uh, with with companies that are overlooked uh, that are doing terrific things. And uh, yeah, we're excited to continue to invest over there. One, one of the things just uh, just worth just adding to that is that um, there's a there there is a, a ongoing change in the appetite of European investors in terms of the risk appetite. Uh, it's really um, significantly moved in in recent years, but still lags somewhat behind the US and, and Asian markets. And that's really come through for me in some of the statistics from last year in terms of investment into this market. We saw the overall market up 70% uh, year on year, where we saw massive gains in the in the US and in Asia, but Europe pretty much remained flat during the period. So whilst we've gone a long way in Europe uh, in terms of the, the risk appetite, I still think that we're a number of steps behind the US and behind Asia and their ability to and willingness to invest large sums into some of these exciting emerging space businesses. Hide, uh, the same question for you, if I may. How is the VC seen changing in Japan and Asia, and what opportunities are there for, for space companies? Yeah, for uh, investors' perspective, the, uh, the fundraising situations are a bit different for Southeast Asia and East Asia. For uh, East Asia, uh, Japan, China, and Korea, uh, South Korea, we have our own market and uh, many local VCs uh, who can invest into uh, deep space, uh, deep deep tech startups. Uh, but for uh, South e Southeast Asia, uh, any countries, uh, maybe except for uh, Singapore, uh, do not have any deep tech focused VCs uh, or anyone who can invest into space startups. So the South Southeast Asian uh, startups uh, need to raise money from uh, foreign investors and need to find most of the customers overseas as well. The same is true for the government space budget. Japan, China, uh, or South Korea have uh, plenty of space uh, uh, budget compared to the uh, Southeast Asian countries. So any startups uh, uh, you know, outside of uh, uh, East uh, Asia need to find opportunities outside outside of their countries. And uh, we have statistics of uh, 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 Southeast Asian uh, space startups being more than uh, 100 in the last uh, few years. And we have a very, very much increase in the startups in this region. And there are, uh, will be uh, more opportunities for that as well. Great. OK. And well, this might be a question for everyone here. Um, the, the Chinese government has unveiled an economic roadmap that singles out space exploration among other technologies uh, in, in its five-year investment plan. What impact do you all see there on just investing in general in space and, and maybe your space companies as well uh, from, from Chinese efforts to, to boost innovation? Uh, Hide, I'll pick on you this time. Yeah. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, good in terms of we have a uh, uh, healthy uh, competition uh, worldwide. 
And uh, uh, Japan's space strategy uh, is to work uh, uh, basically close with the uh, U.S. and Europe, uh, but also to uh, accelerate uh, cooperation with Southeast Asia, including uh, Australia. Uh, China uh, continues to be a good friend of ours, but uh, there is no plan for uh, collaboration uh, in space at this moment, unfortunately. Okay. But it will be a good uh, competition and uh, yeah, it's a good thing. Michael Mark, is this on your radar as well? Is this something that you're, you're looking out for? Because um, we the don't. Chinese, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we, 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 sorry. Go ahead. They're also sorry. signaling an intent to further open up industries to private companies and foreign investors. But Mike, is, is, it, is it still just generally too challenging there? Well, we, we, we don't invest into, into China, um, but I, I would just echo that I think competition is a great thing. Um, and so, you know, globally, uh, we have continued to see every year just the, uh, the appetite of sovereigns to really establish uh, unique programs and platforms for their own countries, uh, whether that be for defense or commercial applications. And I think all of that's very, very good. And in, in, in pushing other companies to put out the best product they possibly can. Anything to add, Mark? Yeah, well, I, I just agree with everything that's said there. Take a similar position to Mike in terms of uh, our focus on the market. You know, I, I agree. It's, this is just driving the space race. Um, so, um, you know, long may it go on. Great. Well, we're almost out of time, but I did have a bit of a fun question to, to put to you. Because uh, this is something which uh, surprised me is um, it seems to be possible for, for VC firms to create their own SPACs and invest in their portfolio companies as long as they don't disclose it beforehand and, and, and other rules like that. Um, any interest there? It's probably more for Mike and, and Mark uh, in your own SPAC to get involved in this, this trend in, in another way? Uh, Mark? Um, so, uh, so no, not particularly. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of SPACs out there in the market uh, for us to choose from. So I don't know whether uh, adding one of our own would uh, would really uh, change the market. Uh, it sounds to me like uh, we should be uh, focusing our attention on the Japanese market if we're going to set up some uh, some new SPACs. Uh, I'm sure, there's plenty of opportunity over there. So, yeah, I think uh, I, I I don't think that you're going to see any um, SPAC um, coming from us anytime soon. Same with you, Mike. Uh, yeah, we don't. We haven't committed or our plans to do anything yet. Great. Okay. Well, sadly, we are out of time. So, let's like take the time to to thank you all for your time, uh, especially given the the time zones. Uh, it's been very challenging, but also I think we we've, we've had a really unique discussion here. And uh, thank you also to the APSCC for bringing us all together. It's been a it's been a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Hide. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mike. Uh, excellent conversation and uh, uh, looking forward to, to seeing how things develop as the year goes on, uh, particularly with uh, the SPAC investment vehicles and, and what's going to happen with that. I think we'll uh, anticipate a lot more conversation about that uh, going forward. Um, Next week, speaking of going forward, next week, uh, please join us for the next installment of our webinar series on Millsat.com. Uh, that one moderated by Carissa Christensen of Bryce Tech. Uh, looking forward to, to sort of peeling back some of the, the layers around uh, the defense business, uh, both for the U.S. For, uh, for, and for around the world, the global defense industry, uh, what's going on in the Millsatcom space. Uh, so please do join us. As always, registration is free. Um, and uh, if, if you uh, have people that you want to direct to uh, watching the, the, the webinar series, please get them to sign up at APSCCSAT.com. Um, Again, all of the schedule for upcoming topics also uh, are listed on APSCCSAT.com. So please do have a look there. Uh, thank you again. Look forward to joining us next week and uh, looking forward to seeing you then. Cheers.